Father, we stand this morning secure, knowing your grace is more than enough for us. And we ask for the heart, for the will, for the strength that comes from your spirit to be, to be people who persevere in your cause, to persevere in your kingdom, to not get afraid when things pop up in our way, to, to not be moved off the path that we're on because tragedy strikes or because things don't go quite how we planned. We ask that your spirit would lead us and guide us, would comfort us when we need comfort, would bring joy when we feel sorrow and hope when we feel hopeless. We ask you to take control, take our hearts, and let us remember that, that our God is with us. And when he's with us, anything that comes our way, we can overcome. We can do all things through our Christ who strengthens us. And so we give you all glory, honor, and praise this morning. I ask you to be in this place, continue to move, and open our hearts and ears as we hear this message. In your most glorious and holy name we pray. And together, church, we all say, amen. You can have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Chad, Chad, Laura, Aaron, Mauro. Just want to make sure I said last time, I just said Chad and everybody else, but... Sometimes it's difficult for me to remember names. I don't know, I just, especially under pressure, I could forget my father's name. The scripture today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This scripture is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now the Apostle Paul was a Jewish man. He was once known as Saul. And at one time he was a great persecutor of the church. And then on the road to Damascus, he is blinded. And Jesus appears to him and asks him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul is changed in that instant, born again, and he becomes the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle to the Gentiles, writing nearly half of the New Testament. He lives his life for Christ, starting church after church, going everywhere, telling them the gospel, the good news, how a man like Saul could be changed into a man like Paul. And in this letter to Philippians, it's one of his more friendly letters. Um, he's thanking them for their generosity, their willingness to support him, because he's in jail and many people have fallen away. He's gone to jail for, for preaching the gospel. So he spends some time also in this chapter telling them about what the Christian life looks like, how he's lived the Christian life, what are his desires, what a Christian desires how Paul has lived his life seeking the one thing, the prize, to know Christ fully. And Paul is actually writing this letter from jail. Throughout his life as a Christian, the Apostle Paul was in and out of jail for preaching the gospel in spite of those who wanted him to be quiet. And he writes them these words to remind them what it is to be a Christian. And this great apostle writes this, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This great apostle 
It doesn't make many, much sense. He spent many years risking his life for the gospel to tell people about Jesus Christ, and he says, I want to know Christ. It's strange. If anyone knew Christ, it was Paul. I mean, he, he met, met Christ on the road to Damascus. He was saved in an instant. Why would he want to know Christ? His salvation was clear. And yet there's something deeper here. Far too often, as Christians, we, we look at our Christian life as one moment of salvation. We've been saved. We do not need to worry about eternity. And then we live our lives not very concerned about the things of God. We've been saved. What more is there? We make Christianity about a moment, about one time. And I remember my conversion. It is one of the most influential moments in my life. And yet the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ. He says, I want to recognize Him. I want to perceive Him. I want to know the power of His resurrection and participate, have fellowship in His sufferings. Because Paul is telling us something about the Christian life, that the Christian life is not just about a moment of salvation, it's not just about one single time. It is about a life lived as a Christian. It's about the desire to know Christ every day. Not just once, but to live your life for Christ. And notice that he doesn't just say that he wants to know the power of his resurrection, though he does. He says, I want to be a participant in his sufferings. In fact, he says, I want to participate so much so in his sufferings that, that I can be like Christ in death. How often do we preach about that? Suffering is not something we want. It's, it's something we run from. Why would I want to suffer? I want to be comfortable. I want to be secure. I don't want to suffer. But here Paul is saying, no, that's wrong. You don't want to be comfortable. You want to be like Christ. Can't you see if Christ has saved you, you want to know your Savior. Comfort and security are not your goals anymore because true comfort, true security cannot be found in anyone but Christ. And Christ told you to take up your cross and follow Him. Go where He has gone. If you lose your life for His sake, you will find it. But if you try and save your life, you'll only lose it. And the question is for us, are we relying more on our salvation without living a life for Christ? The Christian can't do this. Then we will be like that servant in Jesus' parable who was entrusted by his master with a bag of gold. And rather than use it and multiply that bag, he goes off and what does he do? He buries it. And when the master comes to him, he returns that bag of gold to him and he says, I knew you were a hard man, so I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. But look, here is what belongs to you. And as a Christian, he's saying, I belong to you. You saved me. Here I am. I give myself back to you. The life you gave me unspent and intact. And then the saddest thing happens. The master replies to him. And he says, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is Jesus saying, we have to give our lives for God. For God didn't save us so that we might forget about Him, bury that salvation and wait without doing anything. 
Because the Christian has a desire, a fire inside of them. They have their eye on the prize. Paul has not only been saved from his sin, he has tasted salvation. He has seen a glimpse of the prize of resurrection, of true life, and he lives to know that life, to understand that life. Because that life is a person. It's Jesus Christ. Growing up, I was uh, the youngest boy of uh, four boys. And I had three brothers that I looked up to. I was four years separated from my closest brother. And I wanted so badly, so badly to be like them. Uh, I thought they were the coolest people in the world. You know, I really did. I thought they were perfect. Whatever they did, I wanted to do. But because my brothers were not so perfect... Uh, they, sometimes that led me to do some things that I, I wasn't very proud of. But I did them because I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be who they were. I wanted to follow them. And as I grew older, I realized my brothers didn't have it all together. The bloom, you know, kind of came off the rose. <laughs> Suddenly I saw they were normal people. They still had strengths that I wished I had, but... They were no longer invincible to me. So who did I have to follow? But then Christ grasped me. And I saw a person who truly was a hero. That person that the bloom would never come off the rose. And seeing Christ, there was no other person that I wanted to be like because Christ was truly good. And once you have met Christ, you only want to know Him more to follow Him no matter where that may, may be, through suffering, through pain, to the resurrection of life, the prize of, of living with Christ for eternity. And Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to become like Him even in His death. And so must we. The Christian must spend their life, all of it, all of it, following the person of Christ, getting to know Christ, becoming more like Him. But Paul goes on to say this, not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You know, I think, I think so often, Christianity is seen in such a, a boring light, you know? Uh, and, and maybe we have something to do with it. I mean, the world tells us that, but maybe we prove it. And because uh, we make Christianity about, about one day of the week, you know, one hour, and hopefully that hour won't go on too long. When did we tame such a religion? When did we make it about a time to come and leave and never let it touch our lives? I, I know this difficulty. But that isn't Christianity. That's a routine. When did we sit by satisfied that we've obtained what we needed? Paul is saying, not that I have already obtained this. Paul. This is Paul. Our apostle in chains. A man who is writing this letter for, from prison for speaking the gospel. And if Paul has not already obtained this, as he's given up his very freedom for Christ, how much more do we need to strive? He says, I have not arrived at my goal. Well, too often our goal is a time set aside for worship. But brothers and sisters, our goal is not grasped here. It's tasted. It should send us out searching because we have an active religion not a boring tamed religion we have a God who is a living God a breathing God who parts seas who raises the dead who is compared to fire and wind no one knows where the spirit goes it blows where it wants that's not routine that's life Jesus didn't sit back, tell us to sit back, relax, be satisfied. He said, seek, knock, be ready. 
He didn't say, I'll handle it all for you. You don't have to do a thing. He said, follow me. Can't go where I go unless you're willing to lay down your very lives. And Paul says, I press on. I pursue. I take hold of that which grasped and took hold of me. That which grasped me. Jesus Christ grasped this man. He took hold of him on the road to Damascus when Paul was blinded and he heard our Savior. He tasted that living water and he said, I press on. I've given my very freedom and I press on to take hold of Christ Jesus. I do not consider myself to have taken hold of him. Man in chains for Christ, and he's still unsatisfied. You see that? I won't back down. Even if you stand me at the gates of hell, I won't back down. Too often we think we've been saved, we've achieved it, we've found the prize, we've won the race, but we've just tasted the goodness. We're not described in the Bible as fully grown adults. We're born again, we're children in the faith who need to grow. We're not described as fully grown trees in the Scriptures, we're seeds. We must grow or else risk stagnation and death. We felt the sun on our leaves. The water has touched our roots and we reach. We grasp. We take hold of that life that will help us grow. And we are never satisfied. Even when we are in chains for Christ, we are never satisfied. And it's not just in us, but it's also in others. We've tasted that life. We cannot be quiet. We've seen what this life does in us. And in others, we are like like servants to a gardener. We get to participate in sharing the growth with others and watch them bloom in the sunlight in the daytime. This is not a boring religion. It's alive. It's always searching, always seeking, always growing. Have you seen this growth in your life? Have you been unsatisfied? Have you wanted more of Christ? I pray you have. I need Him more every single day. Every single day. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Thee. Paul is telling us the Christian is always looking for more of Christ. Seeking God and will never, ever back down. And then he goes on to say this. Brothers and sisters... I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The one thing I do, he says. I don't don't like this translation. I don't usually fool with translations. I don't think, you know, it's helpful sometimes. But in this case, the Greek, there is no I do. That, that doesn't, that's not even in there. They, the translators added that. It's just this. But one thing gives it that exclamation. I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it, but one thing, the one thing The prize. I do not consider myself to have taken hold of the one. Indeed, I forget what is behind. And I strain myself. I stretch out, reaching for what is ahead. The one thing, it's what Paul's goal is. It's his prize. It's it's what he's focused on. It's, It's a quality of the Christian. It's in the Christian life. If we are unsatisfied, it is because we have not yet obtained that one thing, that goal. As the psalmist says, one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in His temple. This one thing is the same thing Jesus spoke to when He was talking to Martha. When Martha, you know, was so upset, she was 
so mad that there's Mary sitting at Christ's feet while she's working to the bone to serve and clean and do all this. And she brings up this, you know, Jesus, why don't you tell her to help me? And Jesus says this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. One thing, only one. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie City Slickers. I love that movie. Uh, You know, they play it all the time on television. Uh, And every time I see it, it's just an enjoyment. But there's, it's where these city guys, they go up to play cowboys for a few weeks. And they follow the real cowboys, you know, who show them the way to bring a herd in. And uh, Billy Crystal, he plays Mitch. He's one of the city people. And he, he befriends a real rough cowboy named Curly. That's a great cowboy name, isn't it? Curly. And they're having this discussion about life. And Curly says, how old are you, 38? And Mitch says, no, 39. Curly says, y'all come up here about the same age, same problems. You spend about 50 weeks a year getting your knots and your rope. And then you think two weeks up here will entice them for you. He says, none of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? Mitch says, no, what? He says, this. Mitch says, what, your finger? He says, no, one thing. Just one thing. You stick to that, and everything else don't mean anything. Curly was right. Paul says, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it, but one thing. And the Christian must be dogged, must seek and search for this one thing. They must sell all they have to acquire that pearl of great value. Paul knew that this one thing was his goal. The one thing was his desire to stretch for it, to reach out for it, and I would say to even leap for it. I've started climbing a little bit in Dallas uh, when I go up there for school. And the first time I I went to climb, I'd say I got maybe 10, 20 inches uh, before my forearms started giving out. Um, And uh, I'm what they call a pre-novice. You know, that's somebody who makes beginners look good. And they bring me in, you know, when people just begin to make them feel strong. But as I've gone, I've gotten a little better each time and there are these roots that they have laid out for you with tape, and, and, and there are these ways to go. These roots are designed to teach you certain moves in climbing. Now, I never knew there was more than one move up, but that's, that's what they say. But this one roof I've been trying to climb to get to the top since the beginning, and I can't get there. And each time I get to this one hold, and up above me, is this, is this next hole, but it's, it's higher than this. You know, I can't reach it. I'm trying to get there. Uh, and the truth is, it's because I'm afraid. Because fear and climbing will cripple you. And it's perfectly safe. I'm anchored into the concrete floor. You understand what I'm saying to you? I'm anchored into the concrete floor. A firm foundation. I can't fall. If I miss the hold, I'm still going to be fine. And somebody told me, they said, in order for you to reach that hold, you not only have to reach to grasp it, you have to actually leap. You have to jump. And that's one of the hardest moves in climbing because you have to overcome any fear of falling. Your body won't let you leap when it has this safe and secure Two holds right here. I'm good. I don't need to move. I'm planted. I'm not going anywhere. I'm fine. And that's true. But I'll never get to the next step. I'll never ascend to the top. I'll never reach my goal. That one thing. And this is what Paul is saying here. I haven't reached the top yet. 
I'm not satisfied. I haven't taken hold of that one thing, that prize, but this is what I do. I forget what's behind me. I forget what's below me, and I, I strain, I reach, I leap towards what is ahead. And you see, Paul is a Christian to end all Christians. He was saved on that road to Damascus. He was given his anchor in the floor, the firm foundation. He was promised the safety of the Savior, but he says, I forget what's behind me. I know I've been saved. I know I'm in chains for Christ. I know I've suffered in His name. I know I've been a leader in the church, but I forget what's behind me because I have tasted the glory of my Savior. I can't be satisfied with just safety. I want to reach the top. I want to join my God, so I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ and God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Because you see, brothers and sisters, God not only saved you and I, He has called us upward, heavenward. We aren't to sit back in safety on our foundation. We're to trust that foundation. How can you trust a foundation if you never build on it? How can you trust a foundation if you're too afraid to move? That one thing is our goal. It's our prize that we are called heavenward to God in Christ Jesus. It fills life in us, in our Lord. It is a fulfillment in His embrace it is the Christian life. It's what all of us were made for. That we might be like Him. See Him face to face. Are you straining towards that goal? That one thing. Are you asking God to fill you ever more with His grace and power that you might continue to climb and grow? Where you look in your life and see where you've backed down. Where you decide to be satisfied with the routine. Where you ask God to challenge you, to chase you up that wall that you'll never, never go back again. To trust in the safety of His foundation that though we might fall, though we might suffer in this life, we will get up again, we will climb again, and we will find our one thing, our resurrection, our life in Christ. Commit yourself to that one thing, to following Christ on this day, tomorrow, the next, finding no rest until you rest with Him. I can promise you this, it is an adventure. It is never boring. It's one thing. May we all spend our lives pursuing it. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank You so much for bringing us here together this day. And Lord, we thank You for You, for that one thing. Father, we want so badly to know You more, to find You and reach the top in which You've called us heavenward. We pray, God, that You might give us the strength to climb, pray that you might not leave us alone, that you might help us each way to trust in the firm foundation you have set. We love you, Lord, and we need you every day. Remind us of that and give us your power and strength. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. as we sing we believe these words he is jealous for me lost like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind have mercy when all of sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great 
your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. God, he loves, he loves us.